All right, so to start, usually I like to take a selfie with everybody so that I can tell who's actually left in the room. Do I have a record of that? So is everybody okay with getting their pictures taken when they post them on social media? Yeah? Okay, cool. Be here and we're real thing, people. All right, so just one of us to squish in. Alright, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, which is something that is very, very near and dear to my heart. So firstly, thank you all for coming because I guess that's kind of helping my imposter syndrome is that other people are here to talk about it and that really means a lot to me. Um, so take a quick look at the agenda. Come on in. Don't be shy. <laughs> take a quick look at the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to do a little quick introduction. I know like 90% of this room, so it's probably not necessary, but there's a sweet video, so it's worth it. Um, we're going to take a look at what imposter syndrome actually is, who does imposter syndrome impact, because as we know, I mean, this room is full, so obviously it's something that everyone wants to talk about, which is great. Um, why does imposter syndrome happen? Some consequences if you don't keep it in check. Um, I have a really great impact story from a very close friend of mine that blows me away every time I read it. I get a little teary. Um, how to overcome imposter syndrome, which is probably, probably why we're here, right? Do a little bit of talk about that. And then just a couple of cheesy final thoughts. So, this is me. See my video play? Yeah, there it goes, there it goes. <laughs> this is me. Uh, hi everyone, if you don't know me, I'm Em Darcy. I am a pre-sales engineer at the convention. Um, I am actually the chapter lead for Charlotte North Carolina's user group, but I actually live in Philadelphia, so it's very interesting how that worked out. Uh, I do blog, and I write some things, and I tweet about angry things at airports a lot, so if you're interested in that, you should definitely check it out. Um, as you can probably tell, my accent tends to dip and fold into different kind of places. I am from Ireland, but I live in good old gritty Philly. Does anybody like NHL hockey? Yeah, yeah, have you seen that Gritty was finally vindicated? <laughs> so, quick story, in Philadelphia, um, we actually have this mascot called Gritty, um, and he's the team, he's like this giant orange monster thing, and the whole thing in Philadelphia for like a whole month was like Gritty punched some kid in the face or something like that. But no, he was vindicated, he didn't punch anybody, we still love our Gritty. Quick, quick side note there. Alright, so let's dive in. Before I get started, does anybody here, would anybody want to say that they have imposter syndrome or have experienced imposter syndrome? Just raise your hands for me. Okay, okay, cool. Is there anybody here that doesn't know what imposter syndrome is? Okay, okay, very cool, very, very cool. So, imposter syndrome has a couple of different definitions that I'd like to go through. Some of them are really kind of wordy, but we'll get to like the more layman's terms in just a bit. So imposter syndrome is the persistent inability to believe that one's success is deserved or has been legitimately achieved as a result of one's own efforts or skills. It's a lot of words. It's also called a psychological phenomenon in which people are unable to internalize their accomplishments. Again, super, super wordy. And then you've also got an internal experience of believing that you are not as competent as others perceive you to be. And for me, that's probably the one that hits home the most. Um, so those are some pretty wordy definitions, but instead of actually looking at definitions, I prefer to focus more so on the symptoms of imposter syndrome. So I'm going to go through them one by one. There are quite a few, and um, it's going to be interesting for those of you who say you haven't heard of imposter syndrome before to kind of think about these, because they might be something you've experienced before. So the first one is lack of confidence. And I guess for myself personally, I can definitely... I can definitely attest to that, that it's happened on occasion. So when I started doing the speaking circuit, my first ever session, terrified, absolutely terrified. 
Actually, I did it in uh, Amsterdam at Extreme last year. Yeah, last year. And um, my boss at the time, he's a really well-known MVP in the community, he was like, you'll be fine. Just show up hungover. It's tradition. It'll be great. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I did not show up hungover, and he left me shortly after that. So I don't think that's the reason why. But So we've also got some self-doubting, and I definitely experience this on a regular basis. So I have so many people come talk to me, be like, oh, my God, you know so much about dynamics. You know so much about marketing. And I'm like, do I? <laughs> do I really? And it really kind of... I have a lot of self-doubt when it comes to that on occasion, and I'll talk about how I ground myself and try to keep myself level. Finding it hard to accept praise. So for me, um, that's definitely true, but I also kind of think it might be a cultural thing. So Irish people are traditionally very difficult to accept praise. We'll always, for a typical, exa typical example of this is, Irish girls will, you know, wear a really nice dress. And some will be like, oh, I love your dress. They're like, yeah, I got it in pennies. It was two euros. You know, we don't actually accept the praise yourself. It's more like, oh, yeah, it's so it's another reason for it. Feeling like it's all been luck and charm. Personally, I do think that, oh, here's the lucky charms joke. Um, I do feel that it's, I do attest some of my success to some of my luck and my charm. But we'll talk about why it's important to not just rely on that. Fearing failure, I definitely see this more so on the American side than on the European side. So a lot of my American counterparts have talked about how failure is this big, scary thing, and if they don't actually make it, it's like the end of the world, etc. So that's another thing that I've noticed. Consistent and overwhelming feeling of being a fraud. Yeah, that's that's definitely been me. And it's kind of ironic because when I was first asked to do a session on imposter syndrome, I was like, I'm not qualified to do a session on imposter syndrome, which by its very definition makes me qualified to do a session on imposter syndrome. So there you go. Often described as a perfectionist. I am definitely a perfectionist. When it comes to my day-to-day -day job, everything is like on point. If it's not perfect, it's not worth doing, in my opinion. So that can often contribute to imposter syndrome. Convinced that you're not enough and having a lack of self-worth, Seems a little extreme, but it can be something that people experience when it comes to imposter syndrome. And feeling like you haven't earned your title or your position. For me, that's definitely the case. Um, I am the only pre-sales person in Click Dimensions at the moment, and often I'm like, how, how am I? <laughs> Why did you pick me? Why is it me that I'm the, the pre-sales person? But yeah, I definitely get that feeling, significantly so at the start of when I took on this position. But as the, the months have rolled by, you know, the salespeople are not that bad. You know, they're okay. I'm looking at you guys up there. <laughs> um, it's, it's actually, I've been truly blessed to have this job. I love it. So this is something that I found fascinating when doing some research about imposter syndrome, and that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And a lot of you are probably going to relate to this when you kind of start out a new job, you know absolutely nothing. Pretty sure I've got this listed. Yep. Start out knowing absolutely nothing, you're in a new role. So think back when you started in Dynamics. You're like, what is this crazy application? I have no idea. You know absolutely nothing. And then as you start to learn a couple things, you're like, okay, counts, contacts, I got this, I got this, leads. Hmm. And then you start to build up in your confidence. You're like, oh, I can like, you know, manipulate Dynamics. I can create custom fields. I maybe can build a workflow. I know that's a dirty word, but build a workflow. And then you start to feel like you're a bit of an expert, even though you haven't been doing this for very long. Definitely was the case for me when I started at Click Dimensions. I was in a support position, and so you get asked a lot of questions, obviously, being in support. And so as I started to realize, oh, I know the answers to this, I started to get a little bit cocky. Not going to lie. I was a little bit cocky for a while. And then what happens, you, you, know, you help out answering questions. You start feeling like, oh, my God, I know everything. It's great. But then you start to realize, actually, you're now understanding that you know what you don't know. And that's a huge part. And for me, that's kind of where my confidence starts to take a dip, which is that section here in the middle of the chart where you see like the experienced expert. So you start to kind of realize, oh my gosh, I actually don't know anything. And for me on the Power Platform as a whole, I know about customer engagement. I know some about Power Automate. But when it comes to like Power BI and all that kind of stuff, I know that I don't know that. 
So that's kind of where I started to go, oh my gosh, everybody else in my industry knows all of these amazing things. But actually, it turns out we're all just really good at six separate parts. But some of y'all actually do know everything, and I'm jealous. So your confidence starts to take a bit of a nosedive. That definitely happened to me, I would say, probably about a year ago. And ironically, it started happening when I became quite active in the community. Because I started to realize there's these amazing, amazing people. All y'all are amazing. There's my Southern coming out. All y'all are amazing. <laughs> And then I started to think, oh my gosh, everyone knows so much more than me. And then you start to think you don't know anything, but slowly I've been building back up my confidence over the last year. And I've done that in a couple of different ways that we'll take a look at. So in simple terms, I really like this graph. It basically simplifies everything that I just went through, what I know and what I think, I other, what I think others know, which I think everyone can relate to this, right? I think everyone has looked at someone in the community and been like, oh my god, they know everything about this particular topic, right? Yeah? Maybe just me. <laughs> um, and then what the reality is, um, usually what you know is generally quite on par with what other people know. And this was extremely evident to me last year in July, May, June, July. Um, I actually did the MBAS hackathon. And before I did the hackathon, I did not want to do it because I was like, I don't know anything about Canvas apps. I don't know how to build flows. I'm going to be completely useless at it all. And I really felt like I would actually be in like a liability to my team. Genuinely felt like this. It was awful. But in the end, but in the end, we actually came second. It was amazing. And it was all attributed to the fact that we all work together as a team. So I now know that I know some things and it was really, really great. So to anybody who's ever hesitated about doing a hackathon, or being concerned about it because, you know, oh, I only know SharePoint, or oh, I only know Power BI, your skills are more valuable than you think. So I absolutely love this part of my presentation. It's a little bit about who is impacted by imposter syndrome. And actually, when we go through this, you're going to see quite a few names in here that are going to be very, very well known in the community. So I'm going to go through these pretty slowly, so you can kind of get a look and see. Yep, there's some MVPs in here too. They they have this too. Right, Jim? Yep. And there's so many people in here that I have really looked up to and I highly, highly respect. And for them to be able to also say, hey, I do also suffer from some imposter syndrome, it just it totally blew me away. Hey, Megan, there's you. Do you remember that? <laughs> but yeah, it's it's insane. It is actually a pretty significant issue in the community. So yeah, there you go. It's It blew me away when I put out this tweet just asking, hey, does anybody else feel this way? Is it just me? Is it like a widely known thing? And there you go, like multiple people. You've got like Mark Smith in there. You've got Nick Dolman in there. It's insane. These people are amazing. And yet they still have moments where they feel like a total imposter. Blows my mind. So why does imposter syndrome happen? And this one I think is quite complex, but as you can see, it's pretty widespread, widespread in the community. And one of the things this particular section here I, I kind of translate to is that most of us like to live by the rule in life, don't be a dick, right? We try not to be dicks. But because of that, we kind of deflect away um, a lot of compliments, like I talked about earlier with the girl with the skirt. It's a whole thing. Um, so in this case, you know, people are saying, oh, I absolutely love your work, you're really great at it, and you know, it's a colleague, and you're like, oh, and they kind of have to say that they work with me. Same with like family members, they kind of have to say that. Or also strangers, they're not being a dick, they're just being really, really nice to me. So you start to kind of deflect why people are complimenting you, and it's important to not do that. I, I still struggle with it very much, but um, we get concerned that if we accept the compliment, it might start to make us look a bit cocky, and none of us really want that. So it's one of the reasons why imposter syndrome can happen. And also, it's important to look at when imposter syndrome happens, because honestly, for me, it happened probably midway in my career. It didn't happen at the start. It didn't happen. I'm not at the end yet, I guess. Um, but it, it happened to me kind of in the mid-set of my career. So there's a couple of times when imposter syndrome is more prevalent and more likely to occur. And the first one is when you enter a new environment because you feel like, hey, I'm the new guy. I have to prove myself. It's really important that I prove myself. 
if I fail, it's going to be a disaster, all that kind of stuff. Being a perfectionist is another one of those reasons. So, you know, you set unrealistic goals for yourself. So I'm definitely that person. I don't, my goal is not the goal. My goal is beyond the goal. And my, my boss is always like, no, no, this, this is your goal. You're good if you get this. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but for me, it's always, I set unrealistic goals for myself. And then of course, when I don't attain, attain those goals, it's very discouraging. So feeling overwhelmed, so procrastination sets in. How many of y'all spoke today? How many speakers do I have? How many of y'all procrastinated to the last minute to write your speech? Come on, don't lie, don't lie. <laughs> I definitely did. But yeah, I definitely felt super overwhelmed about writing some of the presentations I had for today, and I definitely felt completely like an imposter. So I did the marketing for this event. I ran all the emails, etc., all that kind of thing. I'm not bragging. Just by the way, I'm not bragging. Um, but for me, I have to do a session later on today that basically shows the outcome of all my work. And I definitely left it to last minute because I was like, I'm not a marketer. I don't know anything about marketing. Everyone's not going to come. They're going to think I'm lying. It's a whole thing. So procrastination sets in. I definitely felt super overwhelmed. And this last one is a huge one for me, forgetting the answer to a simple question, right? So let's say you're on the UG forums or something like that, and there's a question, you're like, I should know the answer to this one. Like, you know, what fields are required when something, something, I can't think of something off the top of my head, but for me, when I'm at work and I'm at it with a client or something, and they ask me a question, and I know it's a simple question, and I know I should know the answer, but I still have to go and Google it, immediately I'm like, oh my God, I'm not good at my job. I don't deserve to be here. That sets in all the time for me. So, consequences of imposter syndrome, and these can be quite significant if they're not kept in check. So, anxiety. I actually do happen to have, I do suffer with anxiety, so sometimes feeling like I'm a fraud can absolutely just blow that out of control, so I have to keep it in check. Anxiety can often lead to depression at times. With also some press procrastination, like I mentioned earlier with my session, total procrastinator, terrible. Some excess stress that we do not need at all. And all of these things, if they're not kept in check, can obviously have a significant impact on your mental health, right? So that's why we're talking about this today. We've got to get it out there. We've got to let everybody know, hey, everybody has this feeling from now and again. It's totally normal. So now I'm going to share uh, an impact story with you of a very, very close friend of mine. Um, from back in Greenville, and he is a phenomenal tenor, like insane levels of talent, has literally sung all the way across the world, and it's still applicable to him. It blows my mind, it really does. So in the interest of accessibility, yeah, yeah, uh, I've actually put the story up here so y'all can see it if you don't understand the words I'm saying. So I sung in Italy, Germany, all over the U.S., He's received praise and encouragement for some of the best singers in the classical singing world. He has two degrees. I don't even have half a degree, but he has two degrees, one of which is a master's from one of the top music schools in the world. Phenomenal, right? Yet every time he goes into an audition or performance, he has a dozen voices inside his head telling him that he has no idea what he's doing. Sound familiar? That he can't sing, that he shouldn't even be there because he's not qualified. Two degrees? Masters? Hmm. Uh, through counseling, he's found ways to combat the voices, which do help, but he does still experience this on some level every time he steps out in front of someone to perform. I really wish I could share a video of what this guy does. He's asked to remain anonymous because he's just insanely good. Before counseling, he actually stopped auditioning for a whole year, which really breaks my heart because he wasn't combating these voices. So again, we got to keep this stuff in check or otherwise it will just take over. Uh, he was giving them power and believing them, and that belief was so ingrained in him that when his therapist asked if he was, if he could say he was a great singer, he couldn't say it. That really hit me. To be able, for some, for him to be like, I can't say that I'm a good singer, like, it, it gets me every time. And even when he did say it out loud, it felt wrong. So he's still working through that, and he does still deal with imposter syndrome. Oh, I did put his name in there. Huh. Never mind. <laughs> uh, 
I still deal with imposter syndrome every time I perform or someone asks him for vocal advice. And yeah, I am, if anybody ever wants to share any of his work, I'm happy to do so if he lets me, but he's unbelievable. So yeah, that story absolutely blows me away because I look up to him not only as one of my colleagues, but a very close friend of mine. And I know how talented he is. It's kind of like, you know, other people. You know how, we know how talented the other person is, but they have a hard time accepting it. But it, it broke my heart when he shared that story with me. So now I want to talk about, um, how to overcome imposter syndrome, which is pretty much why we're all here to talk about today. This first statement is probably one of the most groundbreaking things I've ever learned. Um, I once had a therapist tell me that if, I'm starting to feel anxious or worried about something to ground myself in the facts. And this works for me every single time. So for example, if I'm feeling impostery about my session later on, to, later on today, I can be like, well, I did do that work. I did get these results. It wasn't because of luck. It's because I actually put the time and effort in. And so the more you ground yourself in these facts, the better it's going to be mentally. And those imposter syndromes, they're not going to go away, but you can actually start to rationalize why you're feeling that way. Acknowledge your achievements. I, I kind of want to spend a second talking about this one. Um, when we talk about achievements, for me, I usually equate that to like finishing exams. It's one of the things I really like to do. And as a fun side story, um, I took MB200 about a month ago and I passed. It was great. However, thank you. However, I rescheduled that exam eight times because I was afraid of failure. And it's crazy to me because I see all these people taking the exams and they're passing. And for me, it's like, God, if I don't pass this exam, I'm a total fraud. And yet I know some amazing people that didn't pass it first time around. But for me, the fear of not passing this exam was so great that I rescheduled it eight times and it cost me twice as much as the original cost of the exam. There you go. It's crazy. So if any of you are taking MB200, do it, man. It's it's great. It's an awesome exam. If you fail, Sarah Critchley told me this. Love that girl. Um, she told me that if you fail, at least you'll know what to work on. Amazing advice, right? It's absolutely amazing. So yeah, if you're taking MB200, do it. If you fail, no big deal. Lots of us have failed. It's all good. Um, so yeah, acknowledge your achievements. For example, the MVPs in the room, y'all earned that title. Don't ever wish it away. It's a big deal. Y'all put the time in, you earned that title. It's awesome. And we really respect you for that. It's, it's great. So, um, yep, yeah, acknowledge your achievements. Especially all y'all who have degrees and stuff. Amazing. I don't know that I can ever get there, but that's absolutely fantastic. And finally, what we're doing today, we're talking about it. So it's like pretty much any mental health I'm not going to call this a condition because it's not a condition. Any mental health topics need to be talked about. One of the things I greatly respect about the organizers of this event is that they're very open about talking about mental health. And I absolutely love that. So if you're feeling impostery, if you're feeling like you don't belong, talk about it. We all, t we all feel this way all the time. So it's okay to be open and honest about it. And so, I did say this is a 30 minute talk, I'm bang on time. <laughs> I have some really cheesy final thoughts just to go through. I am not one of those live, laugh, love people. I, I really, really hate that shit, it's the worst. But this particular phrase really means a lot to me. You are exactly where you need to be. And that's exactly how I feel. I feel like I've been growing in my career. Imposter syndrome is something I experience regularly. But you are exactly where you need to be at this exact time. Something that's really powerful for me and I recommend holding on to it. It's okay not to know the answer to something. That took me a long time to accept. So again, examples when I have simple questions that I need to answer that I don't know the answer to, that I gotta go ask my tier one support guy that knows it, I start to feel like, oh my god, he's been here six months and he knows this and I don't. At the end of the day, it's okay not to know the answer to something. It's just as long as you know how to research and find it, that's the whole point. It does not mean that you're a fraud. So again, me not knowing that simple tier one support question doesn't mean that I'm a fraud, it just means that it slipped my mind. It's okay. You are good enough. This phrase hits me every single time. So saying that you are good enough to yourself is reassuring yourself that you are exactly where you need to be. 
It's a really, really powerful phrase to say. And as you saw earlier from my tweets, you're not alone. We're all in this together. We are an amazing community. I love all of you very, very much. And I want to say thank you so much for helping me with my imposter syndrome. Y'all are not imposters. And there's my dates. In case any of you want to talk or hang out at some point, if you want a sweet sticker, I got some stickers. But yeah, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> oh, crap. There's sponsors. <laughs> thank you to the sponsors for making this event happen. Yeah. There you go. Any questions? Does anybody want to share any stories? Yes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. What's interesting to me was then when I did the, the tweet survey, it was about 90% male, which is very, very interesting. I, I, do, I do see where you're coming from for sure, and I can't tell whether that's because it's a male-dominated industry. I don't know. But um, I feel like women tend to talk about these things a lot easier just by – by nature of who we are, and men tend to not want to put out their shortcomings to everyone else. But yeah, talking about it is super important. Um, yes, John. Sure. That's great advice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's really great. Hmm. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. We're going to have a hug after this. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yes. Oh, there's so many questions. <laughs> Sarah. Yes. Yes, yes. Can we just give you a round of applause? Yes. Yep. Yep. This gentleman. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Yep, that's really good advice. I guess it's just making sure you don't don't overdo it and the symptoms don't crush you. Yep, yep, exactly. Yes, Megan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. We are our own worst critic, though. Yep. Yep. Love that. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yep. Our community is not short of those people. Mr. Watling. Exactly what the show was saying. Plus, you have all of us supporting you as well. Like, amazing. Love you too, Keith. Love you too. <laughs> Colin. Remember the facts, though. They're not telling you that for no reason. Yeah, it's, it's just hard to really yeah. hard to accept. All right. Yes, Jamie. I was just going to say, I think uh, they was really great. There's a lot of things go down in there. It go, goes on in your head. And sometimes it's just easy to write things down and really sort of break things down and write it that way. Yep. Except when you write something down, you also be working out there sometimes. You can be much more about how to talk about working out back. That's awesome. Awesome. I'll take one final comment. Sure. Yeah. And if anybody ever wants to talk to me about it, my Twitter is right up there. Drop me an email, drop me a line. I'm more than happy to talk about it. Thank you guys so much. This has been an awesome session. Thank you.